Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and fine woodworking editor, Tom McKenna. And with me this episode, our executive art director, Mike Pekovich. Hey, guys. Web producer, Ben Strano. Hello. And Jeff Rose, who, as always, is manning the video gear and keeping us on time. Um, before we get started, I just want to let folks know that Fine Woodworking Live 2017 is filling up fast. This must-attend woodworking event is set to take place April 21st to the 23rd at the Southbridge Hotel and Conference Center in Southbridge, Massachusetts. There's still time to take advantage of our extended early bird pricing. If you register before February 20th, you'll save 80 bucks. Also, if you have registered but haven't booked your hotel at Southbridge, you should do so as soon as possible. For details on the event and uh, to make reservations at the hotel, go to finewoodworkinglive.com. <clears throat> also, the last note about Fine Woodworking Live is uh, don't forget to sign up for the first ever Hardwood Derby, which is a race that's sure to be a blast for all. I think Ben has uh, brought a couple toys to... Well, Betsy and Liz raced these in the hallway when neither, none of us were here. Yeah, and, that was against uh, company <coughs> policy, by the way. So. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to say who won. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be a blast. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the entry fee is going to a good cause. It's going to the, the Cub Scouts troop that is donating the, check, uh, the track to us for the, uh, the event. So it's going to be a good time. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's it's something that we can all have fun with. And, yeah, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a few people there who take it pretty seriously. I think everyone will take it oh, way it's, too seriously. It's, it's this is going to be ugly. Do we have like prizes? <laughs> Where are the prizes? <laughs> We're working on those. We're trying to come up with you know we have trophy ideas and we have kind of uh, we talked about different funny door prizes or I think first prize should be the the first prize winner should get your car. <laughs> <laughs> it could be like racing pinks. <laughs> racing pinks. All right. <clears throat> Finally, uh, this episode of Shop Talk Live is supported by Thumbtack. Thumbtack makes it easy to find and hire skilled local professionals for anything on your list, like cleaners, painters, handymen, and more. Thumbtack customers can find more than 1,100 types of pros in all 50 states. It's easy and it's free. You just tell them the type of service you're looking for, answer a few questions, and then submit your request for free. Local pros will then put together a custom quote for you. Popular services include home improvement, wedding planning, and personal training, plus many more. It's fast, easy, and it's free. Hire skilled pros today for absolutely anything at thumbtack.com. Okay, let's uh, move on to some questions. It's kind of an interesting um, Website Thumbtack. I I checked it out, and they for for pro woodworkers, they offer um, kind of shipping services where you can kind of punch in, you know, shipping or furniture shipping, and oh, we're really, just talking about that the other it, week. It comes no. up, and uh, they'll help you get a quote and help you ship stuff. So that's very the, cool because that's yeah. a tough thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's get to question number one. This one is from Rasmus. I love that name. Um, I make regular mess-ups in the workshop. For example, there can be a little bit of blood on my hands due to small accidents with chisels, rough lumber, etc. Um, that never happens to me. <laughs> another messy substance is the metal powder goo produced when honing blades. Both blood and metal powder leave stains on wood. Do you also <coughs> have such messy substances in your workshops? How do you avoid getting smudges on the wood you're working on? And if you do get a smudge on your wood, how do you handle it? Um, again, I think yeah. it's one of those questions where the answer may not be directly to what you're talking about, but maybe we should address the whole blood issue to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not so much how, how do we get the blood <laughs> off my wood once it's on there. Let's keep it off, shall we? Yeah. No, I ain't buying this. You get blood on your work from every, now, every now and then. Come on. I actually posted a, a, a sliding dovetail with the blood on, on the drawer side. <laughs> Didn't even know I was cut. I was like, oh, look at that. I think I was. it's funny. When we were down in Colonial Williamsburg last yeah. week, Ben, a couple weeks ago, Ben and I, um, I was talking to one of the presenters, Bill Pavlik, and 
he had cut himself up on stage, you know, little Nick, but the blood started dripping and he didn't was, notice it. Everyone it in the audience awesome. is like, you know, it's, it's dripping, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he, he and I kind of had this similar conclusion that most of the, most of my cuts and his cuts were coming from the wood, you know, the sharp edges of the lumber or, I, or hitting a corner or something like that. I mean, most of mine come from stupidity. Yes. But. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I got a good one the other week, uh, and it was it was just silly. I sharpened, I was rehabbing a chisel, and I sharpened the chisel before I finished polishing the sides and filing, and you know, it was just a little tweaking, and that was really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but live and learn. Yeah. Do you I, ever test uh, the sharpness of a blade on your by cutting hand, I, I hair just off stab your hand? It, I just stab it in my <laughs> in my thigh and see how far it goes. I I, I did that just. Uh, Last week, and I and I cut myself. <laughs> it's okay. really yeah. And then there's Mike. Who uh, never bleeds. When does, no, Mike, does Mike bleed? Tell I do. Me. I tend to do cut myself bleed? far more during <laughs> demos than I do alone in my shop. So and it's not it's not just Bill Padlock. It's, no, yeah. it's it's yeah. Or Roy Underhill. In fact, I have a little thing of band aids in my toolbox, especially for putting a band aid on while doing demos. Um, I usually, if I get Cuts. I have Japanese chisels, and especially I have some like triangular profile for getting into dovetails. And the the sides of the chisel are just as sharp as the tip itself. And if I'm not careful, I'll slice sort of the sides of my fingers yeah. or thumb mm -hmm. adjacent to there if I'm not careful about um, how I'm using the chisel. And I think that's probably, you know, during the demos you start, you know, anytime I talk and hold a sharp object at the same time, bad things usually happen. So. Well, that's, that's what amazes me about the uh, Williamsburg presenters. Those guys are all hand tools all the time and they're, and they're instructing the entire time. And it's, it's a really cool thing. Well, but, they, I mean, they're also used to it too. True. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've never bled enough on a piece to make it stain. You know, I've, unfortunately I think the only, the pieces that I have bled on, I, it's not, I'm not dripping and it doesn't get a chance to absorb. So a couple hand plane mm -hmm. swipes and it's yeah, gone. It happens early enough in so, the process. Yeah. I don't normally cut myself while I'm finishing a piece right. of furniture. I'm pretty safe by then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> um, I don't have running water in my shop. And obviously if I'm sharpening, I do get the black uh, smudges in my hands. I just keep one of those little tubs of... Um, basically they're like manly baby wipes. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you know? real manly. So... You, um, but they usually they're kind of abrasive, like the like the stuff, the automotive stuff for cleaning grease off your hands. The orange goo, or yeah, goo be gone. Um, Gojo's, Gojo. Gojo. Yeah, I mean, and that stuff, you know, that's doing bad things to you every oh, yeah. time you rub it on your hands. But it really does clean yeah. up. Well, I it basically takes off the top loo two layers of skin yeah. off of any surface that you apply that to, and it so. fills your pores with carcinogens. Yes, and yeah. <clears throat> So, I'm gonna get so there much goes that sponsor right there. Good product, good product. Great. It really gets your hands clean. Yeah. Um, but um, well, on, on sort of a, a philosophical note, and I think this is kind of important um, in terms of like washing your hands. It's like eh, you think of washing your hands when your hands are dirty. But here's the thing: I mean, try it or don't try it. Um, but um, I generally make a point to wash my hands before I go into the shop. Not so much that I need to be really clean, but washing hands, it sort of creates a separation mentally. It gives you sort of a chance to kind of kind of clear your mind and create a separation between everything that's going on in your life and what you want your mindset to be in your shop. And it just creates this sort of physical and mental separation between everything that's going on. Now I can be in my shop. I can be focused. I can do the work I want to do. I'm not dragging all of that stress and um, distraction from my life into the shop because that's not why I'm there. So um, I don't know. That's, wow. a, that's a thing. What kind of if, soap do you use? If, if I had a <laughs> gong, <laughs> if I had a gong, I would ring it right now. Like, <laughs> boom. <laughs> that's pretty cool though it's a it's an interesting concept i i, I don't I separate, think i wash my hands I, in the shop differently my, you know? my separation doesn't occur at the sink it occurs uh as, on my journey down the stairs <laughs> when i close the basement door and i'm all by myself you know what would be even better one of those um like the rolled up hot 
hand towels. Like sometimes you get in a restaurant oh. or in first class on the plane, they hand you, you know, with the tongs, they hand you the hot hand towel and you wipe your hands off. Or those, off. you know, 25-star yes. restaurants. Yeah. Yes. So that, we need sort of a plug-in ah, nice. hot hand towel machine it for the shop. A glue warmer slash hand towel yes. dispenser. That yes. will be the, the, thing. the, yes. the all-time favorite tool of all time ever. You know, hot towel in the shop. Come yeah. on. Be awesome. Sometimes just a towel in the shop would be nice. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, we I, ran I, out the, towel, the, the shop towels down, <laughs> down at the shop like six months ago, and I just need to get more. But yeah. I have uh, I'm for, I have running water in my shop, so it's easy for me to clean up stuff. And the it is hard to get those smudges off, but I and I, and I typically I'll grab like a solvent sometimes, like naphtha, and if it's really that deep. But sometimes you know I can. It, I'm, usually I'm washing my hands before I'm, I'm going back to the real work. You know, like I have test boards that I'm planning on as I sharpen, but um, usually I do wash my hands before I go back to the real work. So, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I take it to the level that you do, Mike, but I, when I'm doing surface prep, that is like a different mental state for me. I almost don't do it in the same sitting or the same day as joinery or shaping or anything like that but That's it's like cool. surface for surface prep pulling out the hand planes the card scrapers getting everything yes just so yes and at that point yeah my hands are going to be clean and so i'm i i don't i don't think i've ever gotten a stain on a finished piece or you know a piece that's getting ready for a yeah. finish but yeah and i've been doing like a lot of kumiko work it's small pieces it's pine and that stuff I tend to keep really, really clean. So that is one thing yeah. I really um, I do focus on. But and to your point about separating tasks, the other thing I learned a while back, and I, I think it's really important, is I tend to avoid glue ups at the end of the day. Like I'll get prepped for a glue up at the end of the day, stop, come in really? the next day, fresh. Ooh. Yeah, I'm ready. Now I'm ready to glue up. What? Where are my clamps? Are they then, all open to the right size? Yeah. Do I have my clamp pads if I need them? Do I have my call set? No. I'm, I prefer the glue dry while I'm sleeping. I'm I'm riding Mike's pony on this one. Because really? I've, yeah. I've made the most glue up mistakes at the end of the day that, you know, we kind of reverse apart by accident because my mind just isn't fresh. Oh, I get... So frustrated if I walk in the shop and all I have to do is glue up because what? I'll glue up and that's like. Well, then you grab your hot towel. Yes. Grab your hot towel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that is a good point, but the point is don't do it like I'm do all this prep now. I'm ready to glue up. Oh, I can get this glue up in before I. Yeah, dot, I dot, mean dot, I so. I try to I follow that philosophy not only for glue ups for but for any beginning task you know if i'm getting ready to fit joinery it's it's you know i've been in the end of the day i'm a little tired i'm sometimes i'll just say you know i'm going to leave this for, for the next day yeah. if i only have like a half hour more left in the shop sometimes i'll just postpone and then you know spend maybe spend time cleaning up or straightening something so at least i get my full shop time I, th now that i agree with and i'm lucky to have a job where i can walk in <laughs> late and be like dude i was in the middle of a glue up and be like oh you're cool don't worry about it <laughs> We get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Things went awry. <laughs> Sometimes those clamps get stuck. They do. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on to question two. I hope we answered uh, Rasmus's question. I think we did. We talked for a while. Yeah. We did. We yammered. Um, this question comes from Brian. And uh, Brian says, I did not understand Matt's comments in Shop Talk Live number 130 about a leg vice versus a twin screw vice for dovetails. It seems bench height and sawing height are the primary issue with sawing dovetails. I suppose you, if you have very wide panels to dovetail, you might need a sliding dead man along, the, along with a leg vise. And if your piece is particularly wide, it might not fit your twin screw vise. Can you, ex please, can you please explain your thinking about why a twin screw vise is so much better than a leg vise for implicitly all dovetails? Long question. Where's Matt? Where's Matt? I know what Matt would say. Good. Well, he would, you know, insert snark here, and then <laughs> let's get to uh, the matter at hand. Um, a leg vice is, it, it has a relatively narrow jaw. I mean, it's a, um, usually, may, I would say maybe six inches or so. Mm -hmm. um, if, I mean, if yeah. the whole chop is yeah. 10 inches, you've, yeah. So, um, and then you have a center screw maybe 10 or 12 inches below that. So 
any piece short enough before it hits a screw, you can clamp centered in your, did you say chop? Yeah, I he think said, that's what this is. I, yeah, that's I a, let that's it a go. cool word. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in the chop. The chop. Um, or outer YouTube comments. Vice jaw. Yeah. Yes, right. Uh, go for it. Um, so that's cool. The problem is um, on a lot of parts you're dovetailing, drawer sides, case parts, um, they're long enough to interfere with that screw. So typically, and the same thing with a cast iron vise, mm -hmm. you're invariably clamping longer parts to one side of the screw or the other, So, which basically reduces the width of your <coughs> usable jaw by half or more because sometimes you have the big wooden screw, which is really big. So... Yeah. Um, that's the main thing, is that if you're clamping a part that is somewhat wide and long, you're really only able to clamp a portion of it to the, the front face of your bench, whether it's an apron or the bench top itself, um, which, um, which can limit things. On a cast iron vise, which I make do with, I have a, a longer outer wooden jaw that mm -hmm. I can use. So I basically increase that sort of the width capacity quite a bit enough to where I handle, you know, everything pretty easily without doing something extra. Um, a twin screw vise, normally you have anywhere from 12 to 18 inches of clearance between the screws. Yeah. So you can put a fairly wide board um, and fairly long and clamp it between the screws. So Matt's point is for dovetailing, it's easier with a twin screw vise to support longer, wider stock more easily. Yeah. Um, and what Matt said was something like, if you, um, most people who have leg vices typically end up uh, having a moxin vise or making yeah. a moxin vise as well, which is in essence, it's a portable twin screw vise. Yeah. So it's great, you know, leg vise is great for a lot of stuff, holding things horizontally. It puts a lot of pressure on your stock, but for a wider stock that you want to hold vertically for dovetailing, you pull out a moxin vise, clamp it or support it or attach it to your workbench top with hold fast or whatever, and now you can do your dovetailing with that. Yeah, I, so. I have a, a cast iron vise, and usually I, I put it on one side of the jaw and swing a clamp over the bench and get the other side, but I am definitely going to steal your tip about that wider jaw. Oh, yeah. I think it's going to be a big help. I never thought of that. Um, I think for me, what sums it up is that a twin screw vise will do everything a leg vise will do, but a leg vise will not do everything a twin screw vise can do. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's zero to no downside other than cost of a twin screw vise. Yeah. I mean, a leg screw, I mean, a, a leg vise can be a fairly simple affair. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, the other downside to a leg vise is because you typically have some sort of fixed pivot point at the bottom. Normally it's, um, it's a little bar with holes in it and you can put a peg in at different lengths to keep the vise jaws roughly parallel mm -hmm. top to bottom. Mm -hmm. But since they never really are, um, that's kind of an issue. However, Benchcrafted has a sort of the scissor style yeah. Yeah. hardware. <clears throat> And they also have those really awesome little handles that oh. look like a little ship's steering wheel. Thing. <laughs> those yes. are awesome. And you like you spin it with one finger, and it just bzzz, Close, and it just yeah. like closes. So and, and you yeah. do that and post it to Instagram, and it's like three hundred followers. Oh yes, right there. yeah, <laughs> yeah. For Mike, it'll be like two hundred thousand. <laughs> so <clears throat> if you think that's really cool. And that's like a big part of your woodworking and experience. It is. And I understand that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> then you need a leg vise yes. on your bench. And that's kind of the whole point is like, okay, so twin screw vise, it might be more efficient than leg vise and a moxon vise. But if you like the idea of a moxon vise, if you like the idea of a leg mm -hmm. vise, and the whole point of being in the shop is for the most of us, it's not efficiency. It's not how many parts per hour we're cranking out. It's how much fun I'm having in the shop. So... I wouldn't, if you want to like vice and a mox and vice, I would never recommend that, recommend against that. That's yeah. great. Do I have one? No. <clears throat> Am I going to put a leg vice on my bench? No. But um, I think the only downside is falling into the trap of feeling that you have to have something in order to begin woodworking, right. whether that's any type of bench, whether any type of machine, um, or I'm starting, I need to build a bench. Oh, I have to put a leg vice on here. Figure out what it is. Go try them out. See if you like it. See if it works for you. That's why we always recommend down and dirty bench, a weekend bench with a cast iron vice, only because it's the cheapest, fastest way to get going. 
And to figure out what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. figure out yeah. what you want to make. And then maybe, you know, goof around, go to a few woodworking shows, um, hang out in a few different wood shops with different vices and benches and see if you like them. And then say, oh, yeah, I, I really do like that. That's what I'm going to put on my bench. And, yeah. you know, one thing that, that helped me, <clears throat> well, learn how to use a vice was when I took a, a hand tool class with Phil Lowe. Um, years ago, and it was basically, you know, hand tool technique and sharpening and stuff, but I had no idea how to use a, the real correct way to use sure. a vice, how to hold things, and, you know, it was kind of a cool experience, like, oh, oh, that's how that goes in there, you know, so it, and all the tricks to keeping the jaws parallel, and why that's important, and things like that, yeah. so, um, and I, like I said, I have a cast iron vice at home, and a MDF top bench, and it works great. To each his own. Yep. Uh, let's move on to our first segment. It's time for our all-time favorite tools of all time for this week. Do you want to uh, hit us up, Ben? All right. Oh, boy. You gave a kind of a weird look. Well, no, no, because I'm, I'm, I'm about to get very weird looks. He's got a bag. But um, my all-time favorite tool of all time for this week yes. is silly little containers that your wife throws out. That you can then <laughs> fill with stuff. I can just see Ben in the garbage pail at 11 p.m. <laughs> the conversation flashlight. this morning was, did you take that out of the garbage? <laughs> yeah. But, I, I mean, I find myself constantly scrounging for little containers to okay. put screws in. To be, and, like, right now I'm doing some milk paint stuff. Yeah. And they come in this little bag that folds up. And yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I don't want to keep it in that. So, so. specifically, what are you holding to? <laughs> Well, this is uh, Trader Joe's natural facial cleansing pads with tea tree oil thing. Now, I need to wash it out. If I open it up right now, it's going to get pretty strong in here. Um, but so so these are great, but this leads me to my real all-time favorite tool of all time. Okay. The actual cleansing pads. And, and your gifts. Gifts? We have gifts? I've got one for each. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm not even going to touch that, dude. <laughs> My wife these, works in a hospital. I know where those have been. <laughs> I bought these at at a little bargain store in Nashville. I bet and you did. They were <laughs> these are uh, specimen cups. Yes, they do. There's a <laughs> label on the side that says date, room number, name, doctor, and type of specimen. <laughs> <laughs> it says biohazardous on there too. Yes, it does. You're gonna need those so, cleansing pads right after so, you put that down. <laughs> it's empty. Sorry, gentlemen. But um. They're just little, I don't even know what size they're, but little cups. I bought a gross of them cool. for well, like $2. Actually put. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep that on my desk. Yeah. They're, they're four <laughs> ounces, but they, they have a lid that screws on. Uh -huh. They're yeah. clean. We know they're clean. No, you don't. They're sealed. <laughs> Here's something. Um, you really it, haven't touched yours, have you? <laughs> I have, no. Dude. I, <laughs> this is incredibly disturbing. Um, <laughs> because on the label, it says specimen cups, screw on. This is the part that bothers me. It says leak-resistant lid. I don't want a leak-resistant lid. This better not leak at all. This, this better be hermetically <laughs> this, sealed. Yeah, this really well, needs to not leak. I mean, for the record, there's not... Uh, it's empty right now. No, I understand. So, oh, it, yeah, I'm putting empty. screws in here and glue. I use these for glue-ups all the time. I mm -hmm. actually take them apart. I cut a little V-notch in the top to yeah. rest my glue brush in. Huh. I squirt glue in the cup and then there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be this controversial. <laughs> It's not. <laughs> Break out the yeah. editing pen. It's very nice. Thank you, Ben. You're yeah, welcome. Thanks, and, yeah. and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> I'm going to get my rubber gloves before I bring it downstairs. Or I'm, I may just leave it here. There's more of that where that no. came from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep it in my office. Biohazard. Wow. Okay. Follow How about that. you, Mike? <laughs> all right. Um, this favorite tool of all time for the week has, um, it's a repeat and um, with an added bonus. And um, my favorite tool of all time for the week, because I've been traveling and on the road teaching a few different places, um, is once again my shop apron. Because just like my uh, tool chest is sort of my home away from home for my tools, my apron, wherever I go, wherever I'm teaching, no matter how big the shop or where they keep the pencils or tape measures or whatnot, I've got 
my essential goods with me wherever I go. And um, it's really handy. And also, I've been wearing it long enough to wear... I know what's going in it. I've sort of kind of you know, skittles. Yeah, I've I've evolved into figuring out what Specimen what's cups. going in all the pockets. Basically, because the whole question is, when I got an apron, I sort of queried some folks. Okay, so what do you guys put in your aprons? And I got a lot of lists. So basically, now I have my own list of what I'm putting in my apron. And what what is it? Um, so what goes in my apron? Typically, I have two to three sharp number two pencils. Okay. A Ticonderoga, ideally, or the pencils from Bob's school, Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking, because they're red with it, white lettering. And, and they multiply. And they're very nice pencils. Yes. And so whenever I'm there, I grab one or two um, and put them in my apron. So um, at least three pencils. I have a Micron fine line marker, because I like to draw and sketch with those. That's nice to have. I also have a Sharpie, which is good for marking lumber and such. Um, then I have a six-inch rule. Mm-hmm which is good for measuring things under six inches, um, and a marking knife. I also have one of the pockets um, up high. It's this weird little pocket that isn't good for anything, but it's perfect for the lens cap of my camera, which I lose all the time. Yeah, or the cap so. of a specimen cup. <laughs> so um, that's sort of non-woodworking related. If you're not taking pictures in your shop, okay, don't use that. Uh, so I have some lower pockets. I have a card scraper, a six-inch combination square, a 12-foot Stanley tape, a 4-inch machinist square for checking uh, machine setups, jointer fences, and such. And last but not least, and incredibly important, at least in my own shop, not when I travel, is my little dust control remote switch, which hangs from a little thing there. And in the future, you'll have back issues from having all of that in your apron. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's not. It's very comfortable. Okay. It's lightweight. Um, you know, I, I toyed with the fact I wanted to put a 12-inch rule in there. Yeah. I don't have a pocket deep enough to house it to where I try to put it in there, and it tends to lean out, and I sort of scrape my elbow on it, the inside of my forearm. So it's like that doesn't live there. But I would like to eventually figure out how to wait, a way to get a 12-inch rule in there. Now, I just got an apron. Yes, you did. And I had Jason Thigpen of Texas Heritage Woodworks customize it a little bit, and I got the two little straps on the side. And one thinking of one of those straps is I could put my combo square in there, like a holster, if you will. Uh, yeah. Nice. So that would solve that. Yes. Um, Wouldn't want it hanging out, banging around, though. Yeah. No. no. You're going to cut True. yourself. So. Put a fly swatter in there. Flyswatter. Just thinking outside the box. If we're at, uh, if we're at Michael <laughs> Collins' shop. Flyswatter, that'd be good. Like if I'm teaching and I'm walking around to different <laughs> students' benches and they're doing something I don't like. <laughs> yeah. Just to get their attention a little bit. I like that. Sharpen that chisel. Yes. So there we go. That's it? Well, that, and, and you actually wrote down what you had, like you prepared right there. Thank you. I did. Yeah. Actually, I prepared on a pad and I forgot it. So I rewrote it out. That's dedication. So that was for you, Ben. And that's after being shaken up by you know, the appearance of a specimen cup. Yes. During our podcast. Um, Tom? My all-time favorite tool of all time for this week is uh, the Veritas planing stop. And it's, uh, it's a, I think it's aluminum or some sort of a hybrid of aluminum, metal, we can call it. But it has two uh, adjustable posts that slide in the track underneath. And I have the three-quarter inch posts because I have three-quarter inch dog holes. But this thing is so handy. You know, once I get it set to my dog, I usually put it in the same dog hole so I get the post set up and it's easy in, easy yeah. out. I use it when I'm using my shoulder plane to, you know, fit tenons. I use it for surface planing. The only thing you have to watch out for, it's not great for things under, you know, an eighth of an inch because I think they're about an eighth, eighth inch thick. They're slightly lower than a quarter because I know I can do a quarter, quarter inch stock without hitting it, which I think is yeah. pretty cool. That's no, the only I, thing, just being aware of where the metal is, but I've so never the, had a problem. the post move. Yeah, they slide I, the track. I wasn't aware of that. I yeah. thought like you had to drill no. your dog holes to that. Okay. Yeah, and, it, and it's it, I bought the 17 and a half inch version and um, I think it's 30, yeah, 30 bucks and I, you know, it's been really worthwhile and if I have anything thinner, I just figure out different ways to hold it. Sometimes I'll, you know, clamp it the reverse at the back end and or you can just put a piece direction. of hardboard under the piece True. to raise it up. True. Good tip. Yes. There it is. Um, 
And Mike, you, I like that. you reviewed that, right? I a think so, ago? yeah. I have the, both the shorty. I think it's maybe 9 or 10 inches and then a long one too. Yeah. And I end up using the short one all the time. Yeah. I use it for sanding. You know, it's, it, it holds boards in place when I'm sanding. It's an all-purpose jig. I love it. Yep. The thing that I would like about that, I think, is um, at the shop we have Mike's, you know, the T square, little T square yeah. thing that you know clamps up in your vice, and yep. then you put a clamp on the other side. Um, but I, there's a lot of times that I find myself planning something and then doing you, something else. I want to use the vice. That's exactly yeah. it. You know? That's why so, I pull this thing out. Yes. Yeah. 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 Freeze up the vice for other stuff. Yeah. That's very cool. I love it, and I love my shoulder plane too, which is in the the photo. I thought you were sending me a shot of the shoulder plane. I would, I changed, I would have zoomed I, in. I, I was going to. But then I changed my mind. Um, I guess I shot that from a different angle. Maybe come around from the front from so the, the front. rear toss planing strip is in the foreground. Well, I went, I was looking for other What are you, an art other director shots. of woodworking magazine or something? <laughs> Just because I changed my mind. I originally was like, oh, the shoulder plane. Then I was looking at the photo and I thought, you know, I've been using this planing stop for a while now and I, I've never talked about it. So I changed my mind. At least you didn't choose that like angle. the sanding pad just cropped in the background. Shh. That would have been I use a sanding good. pad. It's store bought. <laughs> Sanding pads are awesome. No, I'm just saying in the photo, that's in even photo. like <laughs> even less uh, <laughs> conspicuous. So this is this we're is gonna have to have Ben zoom, you know, give us a different crop on this. Well, that's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, I'm, I'm wondering what what that chunk of wood missing on the front of your bench is there. Chunk of wood missing right here. Is that a dog hole? What is that? That's a screw. Hmm. Oh. That's a frame that goes take around the... That's up a there and just... frame. Oh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Stop. All right. It's a workbench, man. It, it's getting naturally burnished. <laughs> uh, cool. Let's move back to some questions. This one comes from Ethan. And Ethan says, I'm a fairly new woodworker. I'm on a tight budget and I'm working out of a one-car garage, so space is limited. What are your thoughts of the mortise and conversion kits for drill presses? Are they worth the time, or should I just get a dedicated mortiser? I've I've never tried one of these, but I've talked to many people who have, and they they don't really enjoy their use. <laughs> have you ever tried one, Ben? No. Um, you're probably better off for not trying one. Yeah, I mean, I've I've just heard time and time again that they're. A massive source yeah. of frustration for those who own them. On the face yeah. of things, it's great. Because yeah. a, a hollow chisel mortiser can be pretty expensive. So as well, I already have a drill press. Let me put this little thing that goes on there to basically drill square holes. And if you square enough, drill enough in a line, you have a mortise. So pretty cool. Um, but a drill press, although it looks sort of like a, a hollow chisel mortiser, is fundamentally different. A drill press is not really designed to kind of a stand up to the type of force required to not only drill a hole, but square you know, up. press a square hollow chisel into a round hole and make it square. That's why the arms on a hollow chisel mortiser are a lot longer than the little handles on a drill press. So yeah. number one, it's not really the right machine for the job. Number two, it doesn't work very well. The ones that I've used don't leave a really clean square hole. What happens is the bit can tend to wander. So you get a, a rough square, but then you also have like a little scallop from where the drill bit was not fully in, you know, centered with the bit. And that's fine for a mortise that you don't see, but for through mortises, it's not good at all. Yeah. yeah. And you also need to, <clears throat> you know, the mortiser, dedicated mortiser has the hole downs, and the adjustable big, fence, big and, yes. and some of them have the adjustable table. You you, you bang a more uh, a hole, and you move. You just yeah. flip a lever, or you know, move a wheel, and it moves. But yeah. and then it takes a little bit to convert your drill press to this. So sort of yeah. like the thing with the clamp. Okay, now I have to drill a hole. Ah, darn! Yeah. I got to take all that off. So um, a better option is forget about that. If you don't have a mortiser, and that's cool, um, just clamp a fence down on your drill press. And just drill a line of holes where your mortise is and score it up with a chisel. Yeah. It doesn't take that much time that's, to do that. Yeah. Right. And that's what I, I mean, that's what I do. I don't have a mortise. Yeah. But I have a, a decent set of Forstner bits that allow you to drill overlapping holes. So all you really have to do is, you know, I, I typically will, I still scribe just because I like to. Oh, definitely. You, you need yes. that, that guideline. But yep. um, it's really quick work to clean up a, a, a rounded mortise. My, my argument against them is, even hollow chisel mortisers, they're one of those machines. Like, there's a lot of machines out there that, like, 
do the job they're meant to do easily. Hmm. Hollow chisel mortisers in real world conditions with not sharp bits and they're barely getting the job done. I mean, they, they, I love having, having one at the shop, but man, sometimes it's like, whoa, I barely got through that. Well, <laughs> you know? It's just like any other, any other tool. You have to <clears throat> keep a sharp blade on that on yeah. the chisel and a sharp bit. I think you've been done wrong by hollow chisel yeah, mortar. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, 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 it's not the. I, I would love to have one, but. Anytime I've seen. Well, read our hollow chisel mortars is be, being used. It's like they do they do the job me, they're meant to do perfectly. They mm-hmm. absolutely do. But you're I I feel like at the end of it you're always like, oh, am I going to get through this? Like uh, I said, come on over, clamp a piece of stock in my mortar string and give it a go. Really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. They they rock, man. Next. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think converted. all all mortisers cannot be judged by our shop hollow chisel mortiser. With no. incredibly dull bits. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's the thing. You've, you've got to have a sharp bit. And I think Raleigh, I don't know if he did a video on sharpening. The, or Bob he, Van Dyke did a video on sharpening. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean. And he, it was a lot. Of work. <laughs> well, I was like, "How much are they just buy a new one, man?" Well, no, that's a, that's another good point. But they, I mean, they 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 work hard, you know, because you're often mortising hardwoods and you know jamming it in for <laughs> three quarters of an inch or more. Yeah, when know, I, it gets I, hot in there. When I switched to a hollow chisel mortiser, because I did I drilled and chopped for years and years and years, and it's a good way to go. But sort of like that over under is. When you can cut a mortise faster than you can cut a tenon. To me, that was like a big switch. Because for me, tenons, yeah, no big deal. Dado blade, boom, knock them out. And mortises, that was okay. Now I got a mortise. But then it's like, wow, that mortise was, was even easier than cutting a tenon. To me, that's when woodworking became a lot faster and funner because I could really focus on what I'm making not so much the process of yeah. making it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. and then, you know, <clears throat> with the, the mortiser, it's easier to start using spacers that, that you've written about before in terms of doing offset tenons or um, getting tenons to, to show up in different different layouts. Um, right. It, it's a lot easier to use. I, if I was a pro, I would, I think you'd have to have a mortiser, I, I believe, or a domino. Right. And uh, I, I mean, there's... I, like Tim Coleman has hollow chisel mortiser, slot mortiser. Duncan Gowdy has both. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, but if you're doing three tenons, that's about the only way to do it. I think so. And yeah. even to there, a lot of my through tenons on case sides and such, it's drill and chop because it's the best way to go about doing it. Really? So. Yeah. But along those lines, like, okay, so let's say, okay, efficiency, wow, got faster and easier. Life is better. But if you take that even further and say, well, a, a Festool Domino, which is really good, and it's even faster and even easier, yeah. um, I think there is a line to where um, one of my students, he has the, the Domino, and he doesn't use it. He, he said, yeah, but when I'm using it, it doesn't feel like I'm woodworking. Wow. And I, I understand totally that. disagree with that. Well, I mean, it's just his experience of in the yeah. shop. Yeah. That's not why I'm in the shop. And, and if someone says... Yeah, hollow is a mortiser. That's great, but you know what? That's not why I'm in the shop either. Fine, that's that's fine. Yeah, I get that. I, yeah. I feel when when I got my Domino, I didn't have a hollow chisel mortiser. I didn't have, and other than a router, a good way of doing yeah. mortises. And it, like it made woodworking more fun for me because that's my cool. shop time was very very limited. And I remember on on my son's second birthday that the night before I went downstairs we got him like a wooden train set and I went downstairs and knocked out a table with you know with actual joinery and I mean this thing is going to hold up forever yes if we didn't give it away when we moved but you know it's like I was able to knock that out in 2 hours with mm. tapered legs it looked nice yes yeah. and that was like monumental for me so i would never i think starting from scratch i you know if i could budget the domino in i would do that before hollow chisel mortiser for me yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah Yeah, i've I've, I've actually you know i think i've made up my mind to try to save money for the domino as opposed to buying the mortiser well mike Mike has a friend who doesn't even want one well i was just going to say is a student selling their domino i don't know i would say you need both there you go. It's a false choice. <laughs> I like I like both. this guy. 
<laughs> well, I could fit a bench top uh, mortiser. We did a review of those. Probably yeah, had a good, had a good uh, guess. I don't know. Problem. I mean, bench top mortiser is good, and I had one for a couple few years. Um, but the floor standing mortiser, what really sets it apart is the table that moves back, back to side to yeah. side. And you clamp yep. the workpiece with this heavy duty clamp against the fence. Yeah. Turn and the you wheel can micro adjust front to back to line up your mortise exactly. And then you clamp it once and roll it right to left. It's, they're two completely different machines. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say this, when you're dialing that in, like you kind of feel like you're in a movie and like some like yeah, so that like you know and just just <laughs> with the, again with that wheel that little big ship's yeah. looking wheel you know oh man the mortis for spaghetti western <laughs> <laughs> it's fun it's all fun. fun okay let's get to question number four this one is from Alan and Alan says I'm planning on building a dining room table as soon as my wife and I stop arguing about dimensions. Is there any advantage or disadvantage to running the boards the long way versus the short way? I'm planning on having leaves, so will that make a difference? A, uh, Can I say something about arguing about yeah, dimensions? Yeah, we need to address that. Get I'm a not, piece I'm not of going there. The hardboard and cut it to the dimensions she wants or he or whoever. She oh. wants. <laughs> she wants. Yes. And yeah. set it up in the room Yes. on top of a card table or something and live with it for a little bit. Yes. <clears throat> because... I built that dining room table and brought it in the house. And while I was building it, I was like, man, I kind of wish this thing was bigger. And when I brought it in the house, I was like, uh-oh. This, this is big. This table's huge. <laughs> and, and the previous owner of the house had, like, this weird propane stove unvented thing. It just always felt wrong and never turned it on. And thankfully, I was able to just ditch that from the room, and that bought us the extra space we needed. But... Before you like, dude, like, you do not want to get this one wrong, man. <laughs> it's real. Yeah, it's real. Figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know. Well, when I make furniture for, on commission, the client is always right. Yeah. And if I'm making furniture for the house, my wife is a client, or yeah. my daughter if it's in her bedroom, or whoever. It's like that's the client. What do they want? And like you said, help them figure it out. Well, let's get this in there and see if this is what you want and go from there. Yeah. Never go wrong that way. Never. Back to the actual the question. question. Um, I've seen tables um, with sleeves where the grain is sort of running in the short direction, you know, across the yeah, table. Across the um, and that kind of makes sense because um, it, the leaves are typically running in that same direction. I've also seen where the, the grain goes the long way, which is more typical if you're doing a big table, so that when the leaves aren't there, it just looks like a regular table. Right. When you put, put the leaf in, yeah, it's going cross grain, but who cares because you probably have a 20-pound turkey sitting on top of everything anyway. No one's looking at the leaf and the table together. Yeah. Um, I would never do um, the wood going cross grain on a big dining okay. table where there wasn't a leaf because that you're having like a seven foot wide glue up there that's kind yeah. of crazy and um, seven foot of wood of, movement yeah i mean yes. i have a like a three and a half well yeah about three and a half inch wide table and with breadboard ends and and just that smallish table moves at least an eighth of an inch a yeah. year with just three boards you know mm. in that dimension <clears throat> so yeah. you, you put that across a six or seven foot yeah so I would say, are you having the, the leaf in there the majority of time, in which case, why don't you just make a bigger table? Or if the leaves are only going in twice a year when you actually have enough company to fill it up, then you might want to think about how it's going to look best without the leaves in there, which yeah. is the grain yeah. running the long way instead yeah. of the short way. Yeah, yeah don't, <clears throat> don't make an odd-looking or functioning table for the two days a year yeah. make make your table look great for 363 days yes yeah. Yeah. and then the other two days let it look a little weird yes i agree yeah or you can go to costco and get those plastic mm. six foot long plastic tables with the folding legs for there you go. i yeah. don't know under 50 bucks and pull that out and you don't need to buy, build a table oh. at all then yes so there we go there we go <clears throat> problem solved all right let's move to uh our all-time favorite technique of all time, f 
for this week? Uh, how about you, Mike? All right. This could either be all-time favorite technique of all time or it could be the longest-term, long-term smooth move in my woodworking, uh, teaching, writing, and making <laughs> Ooh, career. Do tell. So <clears throat> um, I, um, I use shellac for many, many years. I've taught my shellac method to many, many classes, and I've written an article on using shellac. And the whole point of shellac and, and the point I like to make is that it seems like this really mysterious or difficult thing uh, for students, and it's really not. It's really a great, simple-to-use product, and you should be using it on small projects because it's really fast, it looks really good, and it's easy to use. So I always say, you know, get it from a can if you have to, thin it down, get a rag, wipe it on, sand it down, wipe on with some more, steel wool and wax, easy, done. Um, I didn't want to get into all the sort of the fancy applications, you know, that they use for French polishing and all right. that. So where you put a pad together and everything. So it's always a rag in a jar that lives in my shop. I've done it that way for years. I was just uh, making furniture with my buddy Sean down in Raleigh, North Carolina over the last week. And he pulled out that little uh, plastic little deli container and he had a shellac pad in there. So he had... Um, like a cotton cloth, cloth wrapped around a little wad of cheesecloth, and he just had a zip tie holding the whole thing together. So basically he, he had made a shellac pad. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, okay, let me try this. And I tried it, and it works really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically like a shellac magic marker because you load this thing up with shellac, and it goes on no streaks whatsoever, and it holds so much shellac in it that you're just going – all over the place with this thing and it never runs out. And so I'm thinking, wow, this is really great. And, and the more I'm enjoying using this thing, the worse I feel about not telling people <laughs> to make a pad in the past. So, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like this mixed thing, you know. Um, Do we need to run a retraction? <laughs> no, it's all no. good. Uh, so, yeah, no, the rag in the jar, it works great because, and it's great. I, I teach what works for me. However, I'm teaching a finishing class coming up um, probably, I think, next month at Connecticut Valley where I will be introducing people to a very simple and easy to make shellac pad. In a specimen <laughs> cup. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, thank you, Sean, um, for introducing me to the shellac pad. By the way, I was Did just online today and on Fun Woodworking and Peter Gedries has a really short video on making a shellac pad, um, and it's like, oh, dang. And that's that's the biggest smooth move is like when you know of a technique and you've known of it for years yeah. and years and years, and then you finally try it and you say, oh, yeah, that's that fantastic. works really well. <laughs> so, hey, I have a quick question yeah. about um, how, the store, how he stores the pad. Uh, he doesn't keep it in any shellac. It's just the pad in a sealed container, he, or does he keep a little bit of shellac in there? He dips a pad in shellac, <clears throat> and actually Peter uses like a little squirt bottle to squirt the shellac onto the pad, which is really cool. I may sort of get into there. I'm not there yet, but he just dips it in there, and before he puts it away in this little airtight um, specimen little, jar. <laughs> lid thing, plastic <laughs> uh, thing with a lid, um, like that you get your potato salad. They're not the small size, the medium size potato salad. And he just dips it in shellac first, then puts it in there and closes up. And there's enough shellac in there where it just stays wet all the time. Just the same concept as putting the rags in the jar. And the, once they never dry out, they're good to go. Yeah, because I'm getting ready to, to put a finish on the piece I'm building. And I put a first coat of, you know, light coat of shellac on <coughs> to seal everything. Yeah. And um, I was tired of throwing out these cotton rags. So I was just going to start keeping it in a, in a sealed jar you know, and oh, yeah. just like you were doing yeah. before, but now maybe I want to make a pad. Just don't do that with <laughs> your oil-soaked rags. Oh, no. Let's no, not do that's, that. That's a bad, bad move. That'll be an all-time smooth move yeah. of all time. Shop, yeah. end, shop ending. How about you, Ben? Technique? My all-time favorite technique of all time was um, I was making this little candle stand, <clears throat> and um, I needed to fit the subtop. Oh, um, to the the main stand, and uh, it just wasn't seating all the way, and I could not visually see where it was holding up. So uh, 
I kind of stole the idea from uh, Matt Wada and a technique that he uses with dovetails. Uh, and he calls it chasing the smudge where you, you fit the dovetail with, with the pencil on it and you, it's just constantly yep. leaving a mark and then you just pair that away. So I just took my pencil and, and you'll see in the video, I, I, I rubbed it all over the, the piece and then just put it on there and whacked it with the mallet a couple times and it left just perfect little graphite marks where where it was holding up and I just paired that away. I did that I think twice mm -hmm. and then perfectly seated. Um, <clears throat> and then as I was preparing for this, I remembered Christian Bexford <clears throat> doing this in uh, our recent tools and shops. Tells, yeah. um, no, I think this was putting adding drawers to a bench right um, where he's insetting the yeah the pole and yeah. he used uh carbon paper and i think when i posted uh that video on instagram al breed who follows me on instagram uh had mentioned <laughs> carbon <laughs> paper as, as well <laughs> but um i mean so i i need to go out and get some carbon paper if you can still find it but uh it's just a perfect little technique just to you, you, you just to, you're dialing it in. You don't want to start, you know, under undercutting everything, putting an yeah, extra start, bevel on it. Start guessing and removing yeah. at the same time. Right? Yeah, this just shows you exactly what's holding you up. Cool. So yeah, and Chris Bexford actually in an article way back, um, dovetail dovetail tricks, tips right? or tricks. He showed that little pencil just inside the tails as you push it down. Oh, okay, and yeah. it shows you. Then I find sometimes inadvertently what happens if you have a dovetail that doesn't go quite down, so you throw the pencil on there to see where it's sticking, that graphite is just slippery enough to where it all of a sudden it seats. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so then there's a question. Does that mess up the glue? Does it like, seize up when uh, you put glue on it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, yes. Cool. No, it doesn't mess up the glue. Unless you know that it does, then you write in and say, no, that's crazy. It really messes up the glue because I try not to worry about it. I wouldn't it's think not about worth, it. It's not worth worrying about. Well, my um, technique is I was attaching a door or hanging a door in my cabinet. It had it's uh, it hangs on a hinge strip, and the the top of the case is uh, narrower than the bottom in terms of the width front to back, and um, the divider is set back as well. And so in the past when I've, I've put doors on, I, for some reason, I think I've just realized that all of my, the cases I've been putting doors on were flush in the front. And so uh, when I was, you know, I'd have the door hung on the hinge and I'd be setting up where to put the door stop. Right. I would just put the cabinet face down and, and put shims underneath the door and then, you know, mark where I needed to be uh, <laughs> for that. But in this case, I couldn't do that. And so I was trying to figure out how I do how I could do it standing up and trying to reach around from the back and everything because I'm basically only one person. So I enlisted the help of my wife who would happen to be doing laundry nearby. And so I set a combo a small combo square to the reveal that I wanted in the front and I had a spring clamp ready to to clamp on there and I had her come around and just press the door lightly against the square. So I put the, the spring clamp in place up in the front, and then I kind of let her go back to her, her things. And I went inside the cabinet. Oh, actually, before I did that, I'm sorry, I missed a critical step. I put blue tape on the top of the case underneath, you know, underneath or just above the door. And then I set the clamp up. Sorry about that. Um, so once I had that set, I put some light pressure against the door on the inside and used a, a single a single bevel edge knife to cut the tape oh, along cool. the back, pulled off the excess, and when I took the clamp off and opened up the door, I basically had a, a shoulder of, of blue tape to align the stop to while I clamped it in place, and it it was uh, it, it worked really well. And I I was trying to think of where if I had ever seen that before. <laughs> and I, I have so much you know fine woodworking in my head, and sometimes I I don't remember if I've seen this technique before. If I borrowed it from someone, I apologize, and I thank you at the same time. I don't know where I've seen it. I mean, other than using blue tape. Yeah. For it everything. Worked, it worked really well, so I was very cool. happy. Cool. Anyway, let's um, get back to some questions. This one is from Jordan, and Jordan says, I plan on finishing a pine dresser with a wash coat of shellac, wipe on poly, and wax. I would like decent moisture protection on top for cups and glasses, 
but is it necessary to continue with the poly on the inside of panels or on drawer sides and backs in order to even out seasonal movement? Don't do it. No. Don't do what? I, I mean, if you put poly on, it's just going to get stinky inside. Yes, it will. Not shellac. Yeah, shellac no, would be nice. If you have shellac wipe on poly and wax on everything, you just want more protection, just put more coats of wipe on poly mm -hmm. just on the tabletop or at yeah. the top of the cabinet. Definitely not a problem at all. That is kind of one mistake is this kind of one size fits all where you start putting it's like I have five coats of finish on that piece and it could be something where you don't need that on the legs or the aprons or but maybe you need more on top. So on on my table, um, before I started putting finish on the tabletop days before I fully assembled it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I put the top on the, on the base and then I would just, I put a few more coats of finish on the whole thing. So the top, I think wound up having five coats yeah. and the bottom had maybe two. And it's like, man, it's going to, you're going to, you're going to kick it. It's going to get stuffed up. It's mm -hmm. scuffed up. There's nothing you can do to stop that from happening. The tabletop though definitely needs more protection. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, there's no reason to put the same amount on everything. What do you put no. on your tabletop with finish? Uh, the dining room table that I did, it is a, I regret it a little bit. We'll see. It's, it's holding up. And I mean, there was markers all over it last night. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I put a oil poly uh, mix on mm. thinking that it would be easier to fix it mm -hmm. should it should it get really damaged um i think i probably should have put a coat of just wipe on poly on after i did my four or five coats or whatever i did um because i just didn't quite get the sheen i wanted it's hard to get the yeah. build with yeah. a oil varnish mix yep. yeah yeah see i use this mix that he was talking about the the shellac wipe on poly and um the wax typically and it's easy, easy to do, but I don't give even treatment to all the parts. Like, on, for instance, on the bottom of the cabinet that is going on top of the stand, you know, I'm probably, I'll put the shellac wash coat on and maybe just one coat of the poly because, you know, it's never going to see the light of day. It's, it's basically a hidden, hidden spot, but the top I'll, you know, go, go deeper, yeah. go further. Yeah. So, cool. Well, we're running out of time, but before I, um, wrap up th this episode i wanted to uh congratulate mike what on uh 100,000 instagram followers <laughs> wow <laughs> this is i was not expecting I this much. i don't know what that means but uh it's a pretty huge thing that and, and I, three dollars honestly <laughs> so i think i think mike's instagram account in numbers i still believe it might be all of our taunton franchises collectively no 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 no, it cook, is, like it, gardening? Oh, gar that's right. Man. Yeah, gardening, I take that gardening ain't messing around. But individually, <laughs> it's, it's huge. And uh, what was Matt Kenny's we number? We have 80,000. What was Matt Kenny's number? I don't know. 37. 37. <laughs> what? Mike knew that like that. <laughs> How do you not but, know that? <laughs> but I have a life. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful accomplishment. Mike has... Uh, all of his posts are done with great care and great clarity. Um, just very, ca they're just a very casual feel um, about uh, a subject that he takes very seriously and very passionate about, but has the, it's a chance for him to kind of open up the doors to his shop every day and kind of get a peek at what he's doing. So um, thank you for doing it and congratulations. Oh, my pleasure. It's a lot of fun. So, all right. Well, let's wrap this up. Let me get the confetti off my script. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Tune in again in two weeks for our next episode. Remember to send your questions and comments to shoptalk at taunton.com. And please spread the word about Shop Talk Live to your woodworking friends and neighbors. You can catch the podcast via iTunes, stream it on the web at shoptalklive.com, or catch us on iHeartRadio. Finally, you can keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook. And look for all of us on Instagram as well, especially Mike. And thanks for listening. Have fun in the shop.
Anybody want a specimen cup? I can't believe you don't want the specimen cup. I'm trying cup. to cut down, man. 